Good evening and welcome. We are pleased to have you with us. And of course, we are sorry for the losses that bring you here. We welcome you and hope that our time together brings you comfort. My name is Marcia Reynas, and I'm Program Manager of Bereavement Support at JCFS Chicago. I wanna thank Cantor Natalie Young from Beth Emmett for opening our program. We extend our heartfelt appreciation to Scott Bauer and the board of the Lori S. Bauer Foundation for Sudden Loss for their generous support of this program. The foundation was established by Lori's friends and family in her honor to give help, healing, and hope to children and families that have suffered a sudden loss or crisis. Thank you for helping us to support those who are grieving. Now we'll review our program. Rabbi Joe Ozerowski will begin the program with some reflective thoughts about Purim. We will then welcome Michelle Brand to share reflections on her grief journey. Then Leah Shevsky will present thoughts on the grief process and coping with loss. After this, Rabbi Joe will lead us in remembrance of our loved ones. At the conclusion of our formal program, we will invite you to join a smaller breakout room conversation with JCFS staff. This will give you a chance to share and to be in community. The groups are optional, so feel free to leave after the formal program if you wish. Now, just a, a few announcements before we begin. Please keep yourself on mute. And we are recording our presenters and the PowerPoint slides only. So the identity of all participants is kept confidential. If you wanna communicate with a JCFS staff person during the presentation, please just send a message to me on chat. And so tonight we will learn more about our grief. And as the writer Helen Keller reminds us, we bereaved are not alone. We belong to the largest company in all the world, the company of those who have known suffering. We are here for ourselves and we are here for one another. We hope that our time together will bring you, uh, will help you feel more supported. We begin our program with some words from Rabbi Dr. Joseph Ozerowski, Rabbi Joe, as he is affectionately known, is a board certified chaplain and rabbinic counselor at JCFS Chicago, where he leads our Jewish community chaplaincy program. Rabbi Joe? You are muted, Rabbi Joe. There we go. We always have to get that signal to unmute ourselves. There's probably a good sermon in there, but I'm not sure what it is yet. But I want to, first of all, welcome everybody here tonight to this gathering, this online gathering. And thank you all for being here tonight, giving up an hour of your evening to join with us as we remember and uh, learn from and with each other. It takes a lot of courage to come here with a group that you don't know or you may not know. Uh, and to listen and to bring our own sense of loss with us. Uh, but we want to thank you for that and offer you our condolences for your losses and hope that uh, the next hour will give you something to take with you uh, as we move into the Purim season. I want to talk about Purim for a couple of minutes. Most of us know about Purim. It's a cross in the Jewish calendar, cross between Mardi Gras and Halloween, and you're thinking, Rabbi, what the heck are you talking about? We're sitting here sad thinking about the people that we've lost, beloved members of our family, and you're talking about Purim, it's masks, it's parties, it's Megillah readings, it's meals and gifts of food and things like that. What could that teach us at a time of loss and at a time of uh, bereavement and sorrow such as this? I'd like to suggest a couple of thoughts that might be helpful. The first is towards the beginning of the Megillah, when the trouble arises and Haman, Haman, uh, comes up with this plan to exterminate the Jewish people. And Esther and Mordechai get word of it. And Esther says, Lech knos et kol Go and gather the Jews. Get them together. First of all, Esther grabs the narrative here. That's the first big piece of it. She grabs the narrative. Second of all, what Esther's teaching us is the value of the community at times of loss, or in this case of the Megillah, potential loss that there is value in being together, value in sharing what we have and our issues 
and our losses, our potential losses, and the challenge of moving forward by doing it together. The second hint is towards the end of the Megillah reading, where after our ancestors had their victory over Haman's uh, his army, his groups, and it notes that the day became a happy day, and the term is used in the Megillah, me'evel liyomtov, which literally means from evel, evel is mourning, grief, loss, both in ancient Hebrew, rabbinic Hebrew, and modern Hebrew as well, to yomtov. What's yomtov? Well, most people think of the yomtov as a holiday, and I think in the narrowest sense of the Megillah, that's what we're referring to, that the day of tragedy was turned into the day of, of joy. But I'd like to suggest another meaning. Yontif literally means good day, or maybe a better day. And what the Megillah, I think, is teaching us is something that has nothing to do with Purim and everything to do with life. And that is loss can often give way to a better day. The loss doesn't go away. It's not diminished. It may diminish over time, but it never goes away. But it does get better. For most of us, it gets better. A little bit easier, a little bit more helpful. We're able to cope with it, walk with it, integrate it into our lives. The third thought has to, happens to be with the one that seems to make the least amount of sense tonight. What do we learn from the masks and the costumes? Most people, at least on the surface, uh, they think of Purim as you know, costume party, costume time. I think there's a very deep spiritual message in the idea of wearing masks and costumes. We don't always see what's inside. Things are not always as they seem. Um, that was certainly true of the Purim story, which is maybe why the custom of turning Purim into a masquerade party came about. Uh, certainly Mordechai and Esther and the Jewish people at the time didn't realize what they were dealing with, and things had flipped around towards the end of the story. Things are not always as they seem. And we also learn another truth from the idea of masks. There are times to wear a mask and times to take it off. When we are mourning uh, at the beginning, shortly after the loss, we find it hard to cover things up, and we should that's not the point. That's why Jewish tradition often allows us times like Shiva and Shloshim, the ability to say Kaddish, and the various other tools that are found in our tradition that allow us to express ourselves. And yet there are other times when we have to uh, put on that mask, when we're stuck after a certain point, going back into the world, going back to work, going back to doing the chores of life, that uh, we need to put the mask back on. There's a time for a mask and time for not a mask, but certainly the sense of loss is always there behind the mask. And uh, the lesson for us and for those beyond us is not to assume what we see is what we have. The fourth lesson is the most subtle one and maybe the most profound. And it's something that not everybody knows unless you actually go to Shoal and pay attention to the Megillah reading, to the book of Esther. God's not there it's one of the few books i think it's actually the only book in the in the jewish bible where god simply isn't mentioned god's only hinted at in the most oblique and the most veiled of hints um god's simply not there and um perhaps in the story of purim god's presence wasn't always present only hinted at and even those hints unless you know to look for them you won't see them one doesn't see them so easily and I think what's true in the story is that the people had to go and find ways to defend themselves and enhance life and embrace life and move into a future. I think those of us who've dealt with loss, and I'm going to speak for myself as well. I lost my son-in-law a little bit over a year ago. Uh, he was 38, died of cancer, lived in Israel, married to my daughter. They had three young girls who my daughter is raising. So I'm actually coming tonight uh, not only as a rabbinic resource, uh, and hopefully a friend to all of you, but also as a mourner. I'm thinking of him right now. He used to love Purim. Um, God's presence isn't always present there. God's presence isn't always noted. It's not always apparent. We sometimes seek God or sometimes can't find God. God's simply not there, but sometimes if we look carefully or feel in our hearts, we might find the presence of the divine, the Holy One behind the scenes. And in fact, in rabbinic tradition, in the rabbinic homiletic tradition of Drush, of Drusha, the name Esther 
actually is the same word that's used from the Aramaic to modern Hebrew's word. It means austere. I will hide. Maybe just like the masks where our faces are hidden, sometimes God is hidden. And we have to spend a little extra time seeking out God's presence. We have to find a way to take, as it were, God's mask off. That might be a strange piece of imagery, but I think it's correct when one thinks of the Purim story. As we take our own masks off, especially at a time of loss, where we just can't, we need to be with each other and express our feelings with each other. And we're asking God, we need you to do the same, God. Please take your mask off. Be with us. Support us. We might not see you. We might only feel the hints. But we can still ask. We can still seek God's presence. My blessing for the night to all of you this evening is may you all find that divine presence in the presence of each other. As we take our masks off just a little bit tonight, we need to be together in community and find ways that we can turn a period of sorrow into a day that's just a little bit better. And on that note, I'm now going to introduce to you Michelle Brand, who is going to share her personal grief journey following the death of her husband, Warren. Michelle? Hi, good evening. So like many of you, I'm sure that you never dreamed in your wildest dreams that you would be a part of a grief group. That was not part of my life plan. That was nowhere in my psyche. And yet I feel very, very fortunate that I found JCFS at a time where I had no idea how badly I needed an in-person support group and um, to help me get through this very critical time in my life. My journey started on Monday, February the 13th, 2023. We had just, my husband and I had just had an incredible weekend. It happened to be Super Bowl Sunday, the Sunday before. And so we were together with friends and we did a ton of things together. Um, and that Monday morning started out like every other Monday morning. Um, he worked from home, so he was still in bed. I, what at the time, was an administrator in District 65 at one of the elementary schools in Evanston. So I got up, got myself ready, kissed him goodbye, wished him to have a good day, and went off to work. And towards the end of my day, I got a call from him asking me what our plans were and um, I shared that I'd be leaving work shortly, um, and he shared with me that he had gotten dinner prepared. He was going to go work out. He was an avid martial artist. He did that like six days a week, um, and then he would come home, and we'd have dinner, and we would make a Shiva call for a dear friend of his and who now has become a dear friend of mine. Um, because her mother had passed away, um, and, and I need, we were gonna, uh, make the Shiva call that night. And I immediately asked him if he could please skip working out because I was worried that it was going to get too late and I didn't want to get to the house too late and wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time. And without skipping a beat, he said, no problem. And then about a half hour later or so, he called me to say that he had decided to take a walk. And I said, great, that I was leaving work and that I would meet him at home. And I got home and I found the raw chicken marinating on the counter, which was Warren's way of saying I've made dinner for the two of us. And so I decided to call a friend and get to work. And I put the chicken in the oven and started to make a salad and started to make a starch and do all those things and was chitty chatting with a friend and lost a little bit of track of time, but realized that it got dark. And I said to my friend, Lisa, I said, I, I got to go. I got to call Warren because he should have been home by now. And I'm sure he found a lost dog 
that he's finding the owner to or trying to help some elderly person get into their house because every time we took a walk, that was his MO. And so I hung up with her and immediately called his cell phone um, and heard a girl's voice. And this didn't catch me off guard because I am the mom of three incredible, I'm sure if you guys have children, you think your children are the best. I'm here to tell you that my three girls are incredible. And it wouldn't, you know, one of Warren's favorite things to do was to bring the kids home from school or one, our oldest lives in Minnesota um, to surprise me. And then she quickly handed the phone and I got a strange man's voice on the phone who started to ask me who I was. And I was like, who are you? This is Michelle Brand. I'm Warren Brand's wife and I need to talk to him right away. And he then proceeded to tell me that he'd been hit by a car while walking across Gulf Road. And I needed to come to the hospital because he was injured. And without thinking, you know, I told him I would be there in five minutes because I live a short drive away from the hospital. I hopped in the car and I started to mentally prepare myself that, you know, he would have broken bones. I kept repeating the mantra, all bones can be fixed. I would see scrapes. Um, but never in my wildest dreams did I think for one second that that phone call was going to change my life. Um, I got to the hospital and as I do with lots of confidence, started to walk back to the rooms and was stopped by a nurse who asked who I was there to visit. And I said, Warren Brand, and she gently um, guided me into a conference room. And um, being a speech pathologist, I knew that that was not good. And so um, she did let me know that Warren was alive, but he was unstable. There were 11 people working on him, um, but it was best for me to stay here. And so I immediately reached out to our one daughter, our middle daughter, Alyssa, who was here in Chicago and said, hey, I'm not sure what's going on, but I need you. And of course, not only did she come, but she rallied the troops. Our youngest daughter, Stephanie, was at college. She figured out a way to get her home. Our oldest daughter, um, Jessica, was living in Minnesota at the time. At, it was living in Minnesota with her husband, reached out to them, got them in the car to start coming home, reached out to my mom, and reached out to my aunt, and all came a running. Um. We were quickly notified that Warren was going to have to leave Skokie Hospital, which was very confusing to me because I was under the impression that all of his injuries were orthopedic. And I now know that Skokie is the orthopedic hospital, but I quickly learned that um, he was in such significant trauma that and trauma supersedes orthopedic injuries and he needed to be transferred to Evanston. I can't say enough about this the support at Skokie Hospital in that um, I later learned that he had arrested six times in the hospital, um, but they did everything in their power to keep him alive. We got him to Evanston. He arrested again. Um, and again, I said, just do everything you can um, until my kids get into town. We then had the next 10 days at Evanston Hospital, my husband never regained consciousness, but it allowed us to do all the necessary tests to know that um, what, what our next steps would be. And that was to bring in hospice because he had no brain, active brain functioning. Um, once he, and he passed on uh, February the 24th, and I had to say goodbye to the love of my life, to the best girl dad anybody could ever ask for, to the best friend, and to 
an incredible, incredible mentor to so many. Um, the next several days were just a complete blur. Um, everything that I had ever read about trauma-informed education was so true. I had the worst case of ADHD. I wasn't sleeping. None of us were sleeping. None of us were eating. Um, we um, kind of just cl clammed together in our den, which we renamed the nest, and would only do things that felt very familiar. We watched a lot of Disney and um, just hung together for days. Um, and then after a week or so, um, my kids and I sat down and although we were still in pretty much a deep fog, things started to lift a little bit. And I think one of the best things my kids did for me is to create a list of experts. And those experts included my attorney, our, our um, accountant, things that needed to happen. And we equated these experts to our glass balls, that these are the people that we needed to reach out to because if we drop them, additional bad things would happen. And things like folding the laundry and going grocery shopping were rubber balls. And we didn't worry about those. And we kind of created this list of must-dos, to-dos, and future dues. And really only things that we equated as glass balls got done during that period of time. Um, one of the things that I'm grateful for is Warren and I always knew that we were not perfect. And we did not hide this fact from our children. We always said that, you know, in their adult lives, they were going to need therapy just like we did. And we were going to most likely be the cause of it. Mm -hmm. And so we had a fun for them and not to worry. And thank goodness at that period of time, all of us had therapists and we reached out to our therapists and together we collected some amazing pearls of wisdom that we carried through throughout our year. And those are the things that I want to share with you right now. The first thing I want to share with you is that there is no right or wrong way to grieve. Everybody does it different. The one thing I can tell you, it is it's so important to have a lot, a lot, a lot of grace for yourself and for those who are grieving with you. And it is important, important to find things that feed your soul, whatever it is. You know, we learn quickly that this feeling of grief is this unbearable yearning for something that you cannot ever get. And there were times that we were angry and times that we were sad and times that we were anxious and we could not figure out the words or, or how to express ourselves only realizing that it all equated to us being through going through the grieving process. When we were at the hospital, a dear friend of mine and a rabbi at a congregation here in the North Shore, Rabbi Lowenstein, kept reminding us how important it is to ski the snow in front of us and try not to get too far ahead. And that was a, to, to this day is a life lesson because throughout this year, there have been various times where I can get myself down a rabbit hole and start going in multiple directions. And I repeat that I just have to ski the snow in front of me and just do what I can do that isn't, that I see in the immediate and everything else will either take care of itself 
or if it's that important, people will email me again. Um, but I'm not the same person I was prior to this horrible tragedy. And I don't have the same capacity that I did prior. Also, one of the girls therapists equated the four of us to being four fish in a fishbowl and how important it was to surround ourselves with fish feeders rather than fish gawkers. And fish feeders are those people in your life who nurture, support unconditionally without any question of the doubt. And those are the people that you want to let in early on and the gawkers who wanted to know all the details of Warren's accident and about the man who hit him and about the trials that we had to go through and the court cases, those people we kept at bay and we really surrounded ourselves so that we had people that we could lean on. The next valuable pearl was saying, have, was the power of yes. And I found myself trying to say yes to lots of different things. People who wanted to bring me food. I was never the one to be the person who needed the support. I, as an edu a lifelong educator, I am somebody who is always the giver. I'm always ready to do for others. And so being on that reverse end was so uncomfortable and strange. And yet I quickly learned that that's what I needed to do in order to keep moving forward. I also, early on, about six weeks after my loss, joined one of the in-person support groups that was led by Leah and Marsha. And I can't tell you how life-changing that was. I have met two incredible, strong women who have also lost their husbands in a very different manner than myself. Um, they both lost them to illness. However, the three of us have been lifelines throughout this year at various times and are there to support each other day in and day out. I also, I'm sure like many of you, started to read every self-help book I could get a hold of. Um, one of my favorites that I would encourage you if you haven't read is a book called Different After You. And one of her chapters in her book is called, when is it time to dot, dot, dot. When is it time to clean out my house of all his clothes? When is it time to take off my wedding ring? When is it time to- I, I um, always been extremely manic. Um, like easy. Are you okay? I don't know. Um, when is it time to do a variety of things? And she writes about the vomit test. And the vomit test is simply that if you- feel like you're going to vomit when you're about to do one of those things, then it's not the right time. And so I can tell you, as you can see on my hand, um, I wear my husband's wedding ring every day and I wear my, I still wear my wedding ring because the thought of taking it off for me yet is too hard. And so I would say, give yourself grace with that. And then my last pearl of wisdom is just to let you know that time is a very strange thing. Many people will tell you that with time, things will get better. And I'm here to tell you that with time, things get different. Um, I am here today with the same broken heart that I had a year ago. Um, and yet I am able to appreciate um, life. Um, I know that's what my husband wants me to do, wants my girls to do, 
is to continue to move forward. What happened to us sucks. There's no better word. It does. It just sucks. My husband just had super, super bad luck on that Monday, on February 13th of 2023. And although our hearts remain broken, we are able to experience joy, although often bittersweet because we miss him so dearly. We are starting to create new memories and we remind ourselves often to ride the waves and don't jump them. And what I can tell you that time has taught me is that by riding the waves, there is always a clear beginning, a clear middle, and a clear end. I no longer think that if I start to cry, I will never stop. Um, my daughter, my oldest daughter got married and she shared at her wedding that remembering her dad as well as embracing the beauty of this incredible event were both ends of the spectrum of love. And so I, I, I ask you to, you know, be gracious to yourselves and be kind to yourselves and just do whatever it is that you can to continue to move forward and to live life. Michelle, thank you so much for sharing what you've shared. Um, it's been such an honor to know you um, through this journey, you know, even just just a blip of it and to see the lasting um, relationships from that group um, and just sort of be, be witness to you processing this moment um, and may, may Warren's memory be for a blessing. Thank you. Um, and your, your tips and tricks covered a lot of my like quote unquote educational content. So thank you very much. You did, you did a good chunk of my work. Um, uh, my name is Leah Shevsky. I'm a grief specialist and chaplaincy coordinator here at JCFS, and I'm honored to share um, some general reflections about grief um, and some strategies for coping with loss. And as Michelle alluded to, grief is a normal reaction to loss. Grief is not a problem to be solved, nor a difficulty to overcome. It is a sacred expression of love, a sacred sorrow. Um, can I ask folks to mute if you are not muted? Thank you. Um, although grief is universal, each person's experience of loss and grief is unique. There's no right or wrong way. Some of what um, I share may work for you and some might not, and that's okay. There's as many ways to grieve as there are people grieving. So some of the ways that grief is manifested, emotionally, we may experience a range of feelings, including sadness, yearning, fear, anxiety, anger, regret, guilt, loneliness, shock, and numbness. Physically, we may lack energy, feel a hollowness in our stomach and heart, and a tightness in our chest. Cognitively, we may be confused in a fog, experience a sense of disbelief, or a sense of our loved one, of our deceased loved one's presence. Behaviorally, we may experience crying, sleep and appetite irregularities, withdrawing socially from others, having dreams of our deceased loved one. And spiritually, we may be angry with God and question our faith. And again, some of these may feel familiar to you, some might not, and there are of course other ways that grief may have impacted you. Um, Grief is often compared to a journey with ups and downs and twists and turns. Grieving is not linear, it's a process. 
it takes time and there is no set timeline. Again, as Michelle mentioned, there's not there's not an end to the grief and time does not heal all. It just, it changes it. Grief is something we need to go through. The path to healing and growth asks us to acknowledge our painful, sometimes confusing and contradictory emotions and express them rather than avoiding them. Some of you may be familiar with the children's book, We're Going on a Bear Hunt by Michael Rosen that conveys this so well. We can't go over it, we can't go under it, we've gotta go through it. We don't move on from grief, we move forward with it. Often one step at a time can only ski the snow in front of us. And over time, we are better able to integrate our loss into our life and carry our grief. Sometimes people feel frustrated when they think they are doing better and then they ha may have a bad day where they can't stop crying. And this is all part of the process. And it doesn't mean that you aren't moving forward. As we know, sometimes that grief comes in waves. Mourners often describe these waves of grief. They vary in intensity and frequency. Early on when grief is very raw, the waves are high and intense and can feel overwhelming and overpowering. Slowly over time, the waves diminish in intensity and frequency. They get smaller and there is more space between them. The waves can be triggered by something expected, a birthday, anniversary, anniversary holiday, or yard site, or unexpected, hearing a song, smelling a certain food, or being in a certain location. Although these waves of grief can be unpredictable, the challenge is to recognize that you are experiencing a wave of grief. And remember that no matter how much it hurts in the moment, the pain will eventually lessen. In previous programs similar to this, uh, we've included the following tips as tips for getting through the holidays, quote unquote. Um, but of course, in the first years of grief, there are always firsts, there are always times you may need support navigating something new, whether it's a large celebration or just a hard day. So we realize that these tips are not actually seasonal um, and can be supportive year round. Um, so um, when there are some times that we need help coping with grief, we find balance of what we may be experiencing. In or we, it can be hard to find balance between what we may be experiencing internally um, with what's happening around us. If you're at a forum event and there's joy and happiness and that energy around, it can be hard if that is not what's happening internally for you. So a few of these things that may be some repetition again from what Michelle shared, um, to take care of yourself, be kind and gentle and compassionate, take care of your physical health, what you need can change day by day or moment by moment. So start by asking, what do I need right now? Reach out for support. Identify who in your circle of support, who is in your circle of support. This may include family members, friends, neighbors, coworkers, pets, support group members, friends from your faith community. People can be there for us in different ways. Some you can cry with, some you can walk with, share a meal with. A pet will remind you that you are needed and offer unconditional love and companionship. And feel free to ask for help. This can be easier said than done, especially for those of us who might not be used to be, being the ones asking for it. Others often want to ask for help and may not know how. Grief takes a lot of energy and it can be exhausting. Allow yourself to connect with others who can support you and give yourself alone time to recharge and readjust. Find ways to express your grief by speaking with a trusted friend or family member, participating in a support group or counseling. Consider writing your thoughts and feelings in a journal or expressing yourself through art or music or through movement. Practice mindfulness meditation, whatever works for you. Sharing memories of your loved one, finding a mean meaningful way uh, to preserve or honor your loved one's memory can provide comfort and healing, whatever feels best for you. And then plan ahead for special occasions or important dates. You can prepare yourself with coping tools for what you anticipate might be hard, which may include holiday gatherings, special occasions, or other important dates, again, birthdays, anniversaries, yard sites. Have an exit strategy. 
Think about what you can handle this year and eliminate the pressures about what you should or need to do. Feel free to create new rituals or traditions. It's okay to do things differently, especially while you are grieving. What is important is doing what is right for you. And then allow for joyful moments. While we are grieving the death of a loved one, we are also trying to adjust to life after our loss. There are still people in our life, in our life and things that are special and meaningful to you, even if it seems hard to focus on this at this difficult time. There may be a lot of tears right now, and there can be laughter and moments of joy too. Allow yourself to do things, to do things that make you feel good. This may include reaching out to others or volunteering for a cause that is meaningful to you or your loved one. Serving others can be very healing. And again, use resources for additional support. You can feel free to reach out to JCFS for counseling, chaplaincy support, or grief support group. If we don't have something that's a great fit, we're happy to make referrals to other folks in the community. Being with others who, who get it can help you feel you are not alone. And the care you invest in yourself now will help you to carry your loved one's memory and legacy forward in meaningful ways. Again, as Michelle mentioned, the the bond that um, was created with her and the two other group members um, last spring was really so so amazing to to watch um, the seeds of that, and then was so um, heartwarming for Marsha and I to hear the way that those relationships have continued on um, beyond the group because we know that those groups are are just a, a short a short um, blip in the longer grief journey. Um, Please know that we are here to walk with you on this journey and that you are not alone. Life may never be the same, but we can still learn to live our lives in a full and meaningful way, even after we experience deep loss. Thanks. And we know that sometimes when there are no words in grief, music can be a comfort. I would like to introduce Cantor Natalie Young, who you may have heard uh, coming on at the beginning. Cantor Young is newly the cantor at uh, Beth Emmett Congregation in Evanston, and we're so glad that she is here to join us this evening. Thank you so much, Leah. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I was so inspired by your sharing tonight and mm -hmm. just tapping into my own grief. I lost my father just last year, and for me, the thought of who is in my lifeboat that I can turn to when I am swimming in those treacherous seas that um, can overwhelm us, that those waves of grief that um, Leah was talking about, um, who can you turn to that you know can be that source of comfort or healing, that source of great joy for you. And we know that grief is not straightforward it is not linear um, it creeps up on us when we least expect it and to allow that in um, so that we can be present and allow ourselves the grace to feel deeply feel deeply and remember our our loved ones um, i've found so much comfort at these random times looking through photos and memories that I have with my father. And sometimes those photos spark lots of tears, um, which is also very healing to be able to have that outlet. Um, and other times it sparks moments of great joy. And as I'm remembering funny moments that we've shared, just the two of us or with my children. And um, this is how I keep his memory alive. And for me and my father, we shared the gift of music. Um, he has inspired so much of what I've done in my life. And every time I sing, um, I invite a piece of him in with me. This beautiful piece, so in tears, reap in joy. Just as we can experience such deep grief and deep pain, we also have the capacity to experience joy in the same proportion. Those who sow, who sow in tears, We'll reap in joy, we'll reap in joy. 
Those who sow, who sow in tears, will reap, will reap in joy. Those who sow, who sow in tears, will reap in joy. Joe, you're muted again. Thank you so much, Cantor Young. That was beautiful. Thank you to Michelle for sharing those sweet and emotional thoughts with us. I think you really touched all of our hearts as you spoke. And we are grateful to both of you for being here with us tonight. We're going to take a few minutes to remember. Um, part of what we're doing tonight, besides giving you tools which may be helpful to you in hearing stories is also to take a few reflective moments to remember our loved ones, the people that we have lost. There may be many ways to do this. You can close your eyes and think of the person in your mind, in your heart, in your soul. If you have pictures nearby or on your phone, you can open them and use it them. Think of the experiences you had together Think of the love you shared. Think of the times, the relationships. We're going to take a moment and do it in silence. I'm not sure what that is, but um, again, one of the, there we go. Let's take a moment to remember the ones that we've lost, with the waves of emotion and the memories Fill us, fill our hearts, fill our minds, fill our souls as we remember together. Thank you. 
Thank you again, Cantor Young, for that. We're going to close the formal part of our evening with a reading and uh, by Rabbi Karen Kedar, who some of you know, actually. She recently retired as the uh, senior rabbi of Congregation BJBE in, uh, used to be in Glenview. Now it's in the Northbrook uh, Deerfield, but she's published liturgical poetry. And I'd like to close with this one. It's called The Valley. <clears throat> The valley of the shadow of death is a tender place. It is a place of questions and things unsaid, and grace, and love, and depth, and sadness. My heart is open, my breath is gentle. I am tired and sleepless. So I sit a while by the still waters, and you are with me. God is with me. I shall not fear. We want to thank you again for joining us um, this evening. We also want to thank again Cantor Young, uh, Michelle Brand, Marsha Reynes, Leah Shevsky, and Lisa Beckert, and of course the Laureus Bauer Foundation for Sudden Loss for supporting this evening's program. Now, there's going to be a follow-up email. There's always follow-up to these programs. There will be more information about our support groups, uh, chaplaincy, references, and also an evaluation of this program. Um, the evaluation is really important. I believe it's going to be in the chat, too, uh, right now. Your feedback on the evaluation for this program is really important. It lets us know that we're doing the work that we're supposed to be doing. So please, we ask you, take a few minutes to complete it now, if you can. While we're finished, while we're closing the program, or when you get it in the email, please fill it out and send it to us. But probably better if you can do it now. It's going to go in the chat uh, right now. We are now going to close the formal part of the program with our blessings for you as you move along your grief journey. Um, we thank you for being with us tonight. We offer our condolences to all of you on the losses that you've experienced. We encourage you to continue to find meaningful ways to honor the memory of your loved ones as you continue to honor your own well-being. The two are not contradictory. The two actually go hand in hand. And please remember that we here at JCFS are always here for you. And we thank you for being here. <laughs>